Okay, so I'm going to talk about a little bit about Qigong today. And uh, perhaps many of you are already familiar with Qigong. Uh, Qi has been mentioned quite a bit this morning already. Qigong is a, a self-healing practice that often involves um, breathing control and exercises. It always involves um, working with Qi, and that's where the, the word Qi Gong Gong is uh, work in Chinese. So I'm going to start by demonstrating a personal meditation practice that I learned in China uh, that I like to, it's my favorite. It's called dumping buckets. And I'll just give a brief, you know, brief description of it. And it gives you a feel for what, what these meditation practices are like. So you stand with a loose, uh, loose knees and imagine scooping up a bucket of water and dumping it over your head. And you feel the water in the beginning. You can just feel a drip of water going down the front of your body, and you can use your finger to touch your skin to help your imagination feel that chi. And you go all the way down your body, splitting on your legs, and then slowly, slowly, and then dripping off the front of your toes into the earth and feeling yourself grounded into the earth. And you do three buckets, the one down the front, and then you start again at the top and go down the back of your body, and then a, a third bucket down the sides. And it's is this basically drawing your attention? Uh, there's a theory in Chinese, traditional Chinese medicine called the, the mind moves the qi and the qi moves the blood. And blood in this sense, and the way they use it is, is uh, much more, um, encompasses more than just the, the red liquid. And as you, as you progress, you can, instead of just a single drop of water, you can make it a sheet of water that covers your whole body. And as you progress further, you can allow that water to penetrate deeper into your body. With the one uh, caveat that I was given by the, my teacher, that when you're going in your head, you don't, you don't go deep into your brain. You wait until you get to your body to let this chi penetrate deeply. And this kind of self-healing meditation practice is really the, the, the bulk of qigong, but there is also uh, believe that practitioners who, after a period of becoming adept are able to manipulate qi outside their own body to treat patients. And this is referred to as external qigong now. And again, this is, this is a situation where you have a practitioner that is trying to influence the qi of a patient to promote health or healing. And so my talk today is going to focus, uh, begin and launch off in, in this direction of looking at external qigong. Now qi, you know, maybe prana, maybe the orgone uh, that Dick mentioned earlier, but there were, there's some research in China looking at the, the mainstream energetic emissions coming out of uh, Qigong masters when they were treating patients. And uh, some of them, you know, would be what you expected. I was, whoops, I was, I was surprised to see infrasound in this list, and that's just because I really didn't know a lot about infrasound. So, Perhaps you don't as well, so I'll, I'll bring you along the curve that I followed. So, infrasound is basically sound waves that are below the limit of human hearing. So, 20 cycles per second, or 20 hertz, is generally the limit at which humans stop being able to hear sound waves. There's still sound waves, but we just don't hear them. And, and uh, just another little bit of a review. Whoops, I've got to get this. These molecules of air don't actually traverse this distance. They just vibrate a little bit, affect the next ones to create these waves. But the molecules themselves are not traversing this distance. So he, the human body produces infrasound. And this little guy is going to help me uh, lead a group exercise. Um, the, the, the heart, of course, uh, you might imagine, is a, you know, one of the major producers of infrasound in the body. So with the heartbeat, it produces sound that we can hear, but also as part of that sound, there's an infrasonic component that we don't hear. Now the muscles in our bodies also produce infrasound when they change length. So we follow the example with this guy. Making a fist, the, the muscles in your forearm will make infrasound, and you can sense that by sticking your thumb in your ear and slowly making a fist, and it helps to do both so that you don't. And you hear the rumbling. <laughs> so, 
there's a little demonstration of image sound so you can feel that this, body, that this is happening in your body. Um, animals, animals, you know, they don't have to stick their thumbs in their ears, they actually hear for sound and they, we're learning more and more that they use it to communicate. Um, it's been, you know, I, elephants are, I think, the most famous for using infrasound. And they got famous because they use infrasound that travels through the ground, and others in the herd, kilometers away, can sense the infrasound through the, their feet, and the herds apparently communicate this way. Um, tigers also, in, in their vocalizations, recently it's been uh, come to light that they will to basically speak to each other with infrasound. It's a very important component of, of the way that tigers communicate. And, and the, the long wavelength of infrasound allows it to penetrate solids. Uh, of course, with the, with the elephant, elephant example, you can, you can see that. Um, and again, with the tigers, the dense forests make it difficult for audible sound to, to penetrate very deeply, but the long wavelength of infrasound makes it very effective for communicating through dense forest. And I point this out because uh, I'm going to come back to the penetrative aspect of infrasound later in the talk when we, when we move into the clinical, the potential for clinical application. So humans do sense infrasound if, uh, even though we can't hear it, and one of the most, most profound reactions to high intensity infrasound is nausea. And this leads to the, the very fun urban myth of the brown note which I don't know if anybody you've heard of it, it's, there's been some fun TV adaptations of this myth, uh, most notably on South Park, where they, they played the brown note to make everybody on Earth simultaneously crap their pants. <laughs> <laughs> now, a, another fun, um, perhaps myth, I don't know, uh, Vic Tandy at Coventry University has talked about that the feel that there's a feeling of awe or fear that's sensed with infrasound, and because we don't perceive anything coming to us, it gives us a vague feeling that something weird or something perhaps supernatural is happening. And perhaps coupled with the fact that the resonant frequency of the eyeball is, is in the range of infrasound, if you combine those two, it might create uh, what is seeing ghosts. No. So just to, uh, this is a little bit more background and really getting way out of the realm where I have any expertise and can speak with any authority whatsoever. Uh, but just for fun, I wanted to talk about the connection between infrasound and crop circles, which um, I learned about just to come to this conference and share with you. Um, the tie-in starts with the nausea that is apparently experienced um, by humans visiting crop circles. And then there's a story emerging that if you look at the stalks of the, of the wheat as they're bent over, they don't look like they've been physically bent uh, as they would be if it was a bunch of teenagers with a two by four just smashing down the stalks. But there are small holes right at the nodes where it looks like water has escaped. Um, it's been superheated, so the, the story goes that they're basically melted or liquefied because of a combination of infrasound and pressure, and then the stalks fall over in these intricate patterns. So that's just for fun. Uh, perhaps a little more sinister, definitely more grounded in science and more relevant to today's uh, oncology discussion is the development of infrasound as, as weaponry. And um, I'm going to ask if anybody can help me pronounce this guy's name. Gavro. Um, so, so he and his team were developing uh, weapons. And apparently, apparently, the team, you know, was nearly, had nearly fatal experiences in, the, in, the, in developing these things. This was in 1957. And again, I wanted to point out that the, the key, to, in, in this case with the weaponry, was the ability to kill people without the need to, destroy, you know, break through buildings and, and walls. So that was the real advantage of this. And 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 like in, yeah, like most things in medicine, if you if you figure out that something. Can, can be detrimental to human physiology at one dose, it's often uh, possible to find a therapeutic dose. So what has happened with infrasonic devices as in the healing realm? So we started to look at this. Um, we, we, through my interactions working with qi, the Qigong practitioners in the Qigong community, we became aware of a device that was affectionately called the Qigong machine. Now, the, 